In this video, I'll be sharing 10 things you should not do as killer. Number 1. You should not use perks that conflict with your killer's power. Here, take a look at these three perk loadouts and see if you can figure out which perks don't go well with each killer. Let's start with the Wraith. If you guessed that Distressing, Unnerving Presence, and Insidious didn't go together, then... You're right. These perks don't suit the Wraith because they rely on the killer's tear radius, and the Wraith's power reduces his tear radius to zero. So you'd be better off swapping these perks for different ones. Now let's look at the Huntress. She's a killer that relies more on injuring survivors with her hatchets than her basic attacks. So perks like Save the Best for Last and Unrelenting aren't going to be very useful to her, because they only offer benefits to basic attacks. You'd be better off axing those perks and picking out some different ones. And last we have the Spirit. Using her face walk ability, she can oftentimes completely ignore pallets. So a perk like Brutal Strength, which reduces the time it takes to break pallets, isn't going to be very useful to her. And Bitter Murmur, which reveals survivor auras when they complete a generator, has poor synergy with her power because she can't see auras while using it. So when it comes to these perks, you're going to want to do a 360 degree turn and phase walk away. Now the second thing you shouldn't do is chase survivors through overpowered loops. These loops often feature pallets or windows that cannot be mind gamed and will consume more time than you can afford to waste. Unless you cast a survivor by surprise, play a killer that can deal with the loop quickly, or have perks that can end the chase faster, it's usually a better idea to let the survivor go. Which leads into our third topic, not knowing when to let survivors go. Now, there are quite a few variables to consider before deciding to let a survivor go. Your killer, your cooldowns, your perks, the number of generators remaining, the number of survivors remaining. But here's one example. Here we see Claude at number 1 on her last hook, and Claude at number 2 who starts running away from the hook after seeing me. Now, it would have been easy to just wait at the hook until this Claude died, but I decided to chase the other Claude to show what happens when you don't let survivors go. Claude gets her Lithe activate, which allows her to lure me away from the hook before she goes down. This enables her teammates to save the other Claudette. On top of that, this Claudette was only on her first hook. So this play actually worked in the survivor's favor. They traded a player on their first hook to save a player on their last hook. Now the fourth thing you shouldn't do is break unsafe pallets. An unsafe pallet is one whose sides are both just a short distance away, and can be reached without having to break it. Oftentimes, you can ignore the pallet and land hit on the survivor just by faking a movement towards one side of the pallet, then moving towards the other. And some killers, like the doctor, can turn pallets that would normally be safe into unsafe ones. So recognizing unsafe pallets can help you shorten your chases. The fifth thing you shouldn't do is fall for commonly used survivor perks. Dead hard, borrowed time, decisive strike, and more can all single-handedly cost you the game if you don't deal with them properly. Dead Hard can be countered by waiting for the survivor to use it before you swing at them. Borrowed Time can be countered by killers or perks that can reduce their tear radius to zero, or by waiting 15 seconds before attacking the survivor. And Decisive Strike can be countered by slugging the survivor, or waiting 60 seconds before picking them up. The sixth thing you shouldn't do is fail to prioritize your objectives. Let's have a look at this clip. You'll see I'm working on one of the most important generators on the map and the killer is nowhere to be found for quite a while. Once the killer does show up, he drives me away from the generator, but I discover his ruin totem in the process. Now, any killer with eyes could see I'd run towards his totem, but this one didn't stop me at all from cleansing it, even with him still being in the same area. This is an example of a killer who doesn't prioritize his objectives. The seventh thing you shouldn't do is allow survivors to lure you away from generators. You'll see in this clip, Ayui is running towards the corner of the map, far away from the remaining generators. Chasing her into this isolated area puts zero pressure on her teammates, and allows them to complete their objectives risk-free. So before deciding to chase a survivor, think about where they're leading you first. The eighth thing you shouldn't do is fall for common jukes. Some of these include line of sight jukes, 180 degree turns, 360 degree turns, Pallet baits, 
flashlight jukes. And window jukes. Simply knowing these exist can help prevent you from falling for them. But if they didn't work at least some of the time, survivors wouldn't use them. So if you lose a survivor during a chase, think about what juke they might have pulled on you so it doesn't happen again next time. The ninth thing you shouldn't do is hook a survivor when you have pressure on their team. You'll see in this clip that I have one survivor downed and one survivor on the hook. I could hook the down survivor, but by doing so, the remaining survivors would be given time to unhook their teammate, and I would lose the pressure of 50% of their team being incapacitated. So instead, I decided to look for the remaining survivors and managed to incapacitate 75% of their team at once. This puts massive pressure on the last survivor and guarantees a victory for me if I find them before they can rescue their allies. So before hooking a survivor, consider if there's another move you could make that could put more pressure on their team. And the final thing you shouldn't do is ignore audio and visual cues. Let's look at a few examples where audio and visual cues help me find survivors. In this first clip, a survivor fails a skill check while healing. They make the mistake of assuming I won't check it out, and I punish them for it. In this second clip, I hear a notification behind the coal tower, but I'm not sure what it is. I search around the area and listen for grunts of pain from injured survivors, but find nothing. Then it dawns on me. The only way I wouldn't have found a trace of a survivor is if they were hiding inside a locker. So not only do visual and audio cues help you find survivors, but the absence of them can help you as well. And the final clip shows how crows can tip you off to a survivor's location. Either by seeing or hearing them take off, you can tell if a survivor is hiding nearby. So keep your eyes and ears open. Practically everything survivors do makes a sound. All you need to do is listen. So thanks for watching. If you found this video helpful, make sure to subscribe for future content.